Mike, thank you so much, first of all, um, for taking the time for everybody in the audience. Uh, yeah, hello, and and my name is George Soto, along with my co-host, Justin Dorfman. And of course, you're watching Startups Unedited. This podcast has been around for, um, yeah, about eight years now, and we've been having a lot of fun with it. Mike, why don't you take a quick second to just kind of introduce yourself, tell folks a little bit about your career background and how did you get into this startup founder journey? <laughs> yeah, so thanks for having me on, guys, first of all. Or hey, Justin. Uh, yeah, so my background uh, was started as my my career as a mechanical engineer. Decided to go to a seventy thousand person organization, three M. Worked there for about five years in R and D. But during it, started a couple companies, uh, and that's when I kind of got bit by the entrepreneur bug. So ended up moving out to Silicon Valley in California, thinking, okay, I want to start something, and I want to go all in on this. <clears throat> and so. Ended up starting, we we're just talking about Fitbit for Dogs, started Fitbit for Dogs with a couple co-founders, which then we shut down after a few months and decided to work on a mobile app. We worked on that mobile app for about a year, struggled to grow it organically and profitably. And that's when we discovered the challenges in the mobile ecosystem in 2013 around mobile linking and measurement. And so we pivoted into some of the tech that we'd started building for ourselves and ended up building this company called Branch. And fast forward eight years, uh, Branch is 500 person company. We're powering about 100,000 apps. Uh, we basically handle all the mobile linking into and out of the app, as well as some of the measurements so they can attribute where their users are coming from. Uh, it's been a wild, wild journey the last eight years. By the way, I just have to say, you look pretty damn healthy for a guy who's. <laughs> who's um... You want to know what it is, dude? I, I will tell you because I wasn't always healthy. In fact, if you look at, back at some pictures in 2020, you know, during COVID, I started eating just kind of like junk food, started getting food delivery, um, started drinking heavily. And in early 2021, I decided to start working out again, which I hadn't worked out in like eight years. Basically, the entire startup journey, I hadn't worked out. And so I went for a run. I wrote a, a blog post about this. I went for a run, couldn't run half a mile. And so I was like, shit. So I just, you know, every day I just started walking, would walk three miles, four miles, five miles. And I was doing it so much that, and my body hadn't, wasn't used to, it didn't have any muscle, wasn't used to exercising that I ended up tearing both of my calves when I decided to try to run again. So I ended up cycling and then I got into swimming and that led to me eventually a few months later being, oh, maybe I can do a triathlon if I can run again. So I learned, I got back on the running track and ended up getting into triathlon, did a couple half Ironmans, um, currently taking a break from that, but, uh, the, the biggest thing that I've changed over the last month and sharing this because it's been life-changing for me is I quit drinking completely. So no more alcohol, absolutely wild life-changing. I'd always done like the couple weeks or maybe a month, but like just completely no drinking, no alcohol. It's, it's been amazing. And I'm doing a, basically the carnivore diet, but with a little bit of vegetables in there. So it's essentially all meat very low carbs it's meat and protein and fats so and that um, i think clearer my mind works better i'm happier um so those quit quitting drinking and changing moving to a high protein low carb diet has been absolutely life-changing for me so i appreciate i appreciate the compliment but it's it's from those things awesome <laughs> i'm curious about the the quitting drinking um I'm, I'm not a big drinker myself but uh, you know, occasionally in social settings, obviously have, have a couple of drinks. I found in the tech world and maybe just the business world in general, it's hard, right? You go to these meetups, you go to these customer events and, you know, people are drinking, they're having a good time. I'm curious how you've managed to, I guess, get away from the peer pressure or, yeah. or manage that. I, I, it's so fascinating because I was worried about the same thing, right? And there's a couple things. One, I kind of always used, I always had an excuse. I always had a reason, right? It was always like, oh, but you know, work dinners, social events, whatever. And I read this book. Well, I started the book. I didn't finish it, but the easy way to quit drinking or something like that. Joe Rogan, somebody mentioned it on the Joe Rogan podcast, checked it out. And the high level concept is all these reasons that we attribute to why we drink or why we should drink. They're actually BS. Like if you actually break down all the reasons why you think you drink and then work backwards, you can reverse engineer that you actually don't need it and that there's a lot of other ways to go about doing it. So I did this test, right, where I, I had a couple of work dinners, two, two weeks in a row, I had some work dinners and a couple of events. And I was like, oh man, it's going to be hard because I was like two weeks into the no drinking thing at this point. 
and went to the work dinners, but it was just, it was easy. First of all, just to say, no, I'm not drinking anymore. I quit drinking. And which, first of all, I had a couple of people be like, oh my God, thank God. Cause like, I didn't want to drink, but I felt pressured. And now I don't, now I'm going to get club soda. That was, that was really amazing to see. But the second thing was because I wasn't drinking, I was clearer. I was sharper. I could facilitate conversations better. I could pick up on subtle cues that you don't pick up on when you're actually, when you have a few drinks and you're just kind of like having a good time and you can realize, oh, like this person's quieter, but they wanted to say something. They want to jump in. It was amazing to be able to facilitate a conversation at dinner in a way that was kind of uh, much better and kind of progressed the conversation forward versus if everyone's just kind of drinking and nobody's facilitating it and you're just kind of like, ah, oh, whatever, um, it can, it can be less productive. So I actually found it was beneficial from a professional standpoint to not be drinking because I was able to pick up on those subtle cues and engage in conversations that I otherwise wouldn't have. So I'm a big awesome. fan. My brother also, I was talking to him the other day. He's like, yeah, I'm going to quit for a year and I don't, but I don't know if I'm ever going to go back. Um, so anyway, well, we're not say, here to think, talk about drinking. Well, and, I don't know, maybe, right. Cause <laughs> but it's fascinating. It is. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, first of all, I love this because, and I know we have some like business related topics to talk about real quick. Um, but I just wanted to say, I, I very much appreciate you, Mike, just kind of just opening up, you know, being a bit vulnerable there. Some, some would not be, feel comfortable sharing that, but I, I can assure you that I totally get it. Um, I, I have been going through a similar evolution in the last couple of years. I think not to get into woo woo bullshit, um, but uh, which I don't consider bullshit. So I don't know why I said bullshit, but uh I would say woo woo stuff. Um, you know, I I don't know. I think there's this massive shift that's going on. Um, I just see it everywhere. Like SaaS founders of friends of mine who I would have stereotyped as a tech bro kind of person who are just talking about spirituality and mental health mm -hmm. and these things in in such vulnerable ways that were not typically macho or manly or business appropriate who are just out there and um and so I just think there's this this species wide shift that's going on that you know i again that i'm just seeing but anyways Dude, um, there, there is and an, the one one thing to comment on that which i i think is important and i'm an open book so i have no problem sharing but uh, i suffer from pretty severe depression i have most of my life and i was diagnosed in kind of my mid-20s so call it like 12 years ago and unfortunately i have major depressive disorder and it's it's largely treatment resistant like i, I take some medication and like it helps a little bit but um i go through like really really tough depressive episodes that i mean insane for anyone that's never suffered from depression it's like you you can't you can it's it's hard to imagine what it's like and what i found is exercise definitely helps but for me the drinking cutting out drinking and changing my diet to be high protein and low carb were life changing it's the like this is the best i've felt in probably 6 to 8 years and the last time I felt this good, I similarly had cut out drinking and was in a very high protein, low carb diet. And so I've really narrowed in for me, the biggest things that I can do besides exercise are diet and no alcohol for somebody that has depression, right? And, and everybody's different. Everybody reacts differently to the food and drink, but for, for my body, for my brain, the alcohol, I think was this, the catalyst that would lead to a negative cycle of then bad food choices. Those bad food choices would make me feel a little bit sick, which then, you know, leads to other bad things and makes it harder to get out of bed, all these types of things. So, um, I think figuring out, testing a lot of different things is the first thing, figuring out what it, your body reacts to or doesn't react to and what, and testing out things for, you know, give it 10 days, right? I started the, basically the carnivore diet. I tried it for 10 days. I was like, I'm just going to do it for 10 days. First three days, super rough, super rough. Cause my body was detoxing all the carbs, all the sugars that I had been used to by day five. I was like, all right, this is pretty good. By day 10, I'm like, this is a lifestyle change for me. This isn't like a day 10, it's over. I'm going to go back to eating the way I was. It was day 10. I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing this forever because I felt so much better. I had the most energy I've, I've had in years, consistent energy. I wasn't sluggish. I was waking up in the morning before my alarm clock. That has never happened for me before. Ever since I was a kid, I needed an alarm clock. And so these things, I mean, I think it's important to talk, talk about and for everyone to kind of know what works for certain people. Again, not everything's going to work for the, for other people. Um, same things don't work effectively for others, but for, for me, that's what worked for me, cutting out the drinking and, and 
cutting out a lot of carbs, processed foods, and refined sugars. You know, I got to introduce you to my buddy, Scott, if you're open to it, Scott Britton, who was one of the co-founders of Troops. It was a mm, yeah. SaaS That'd business. Awesome. Yeah, he's got that. a podcast now all about human evolution and consciousness, and he's very, very vulnerable about his own you know, experiences with spirituality and mental health and his journeys with ayahuasca and all kinds of stuff. Um, so yeah. I'll, I'll be sure to to introduce you guys. At, at a minimum, you should definitely meet. He's a great guy. He just sold that business in the last year to Salesforce. Just, yeah, and, to Salesforce, right? Yeah, yeah that's, <clears throat> that's right. That's awesome. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to meet him. And there's another guy, another podcaster who's got um, a good following, Justin Caviar. He talks a lot about these types of things and biohacking just in general to maximize productivity. Um and so he, he's kind of always testing and, and optimizing various different things like this. All right. Well, you know, this, uh, again, like this mental health stuff, I think, uh, spiritual health, you know, just biohacking, you know, I think it all is in the same genres. I think for me, if you think about it as a startup founder, I remember doing a documentary series uh where i was going in person this was like the document documentary like in-person version of this podcast and we were just having a lot of fun back in the bay area we shot some in like amsterdam and spain and some other folks but one of the biggest questions that i asked um was like how do you actually sustain a, a career as a startup founder and you know, given the pressures, right? I mean, you you wrote that blog post there, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, I wanted to ask you about it a little bit around, like, um, you know, joining a seed company, but uh, but I but everyone said every startup founder CEO said like unanimously was like you need to take care of your health. You need some sort of like you know uh, meditation practice, running, whatever. And that's the only way because it's like you're basically staring in, into uncertainty, you know, every day. And, uh, you know, that I can definitely relate to that um, just given my experiences. I'd also say that we are probably living in a world today that has more uncertainty that's in your face. Now, maybe it's always been like this, right? That's kind of the paradox of it all. Maybe it's always been like this. I mean, if you look at spiritual books or religious texts, you know, I mean, look at the stoicism stuff, but, you know, again, Buddhism, you know, Hinduism, Judaism, the whole thing, right? There's always been this yearning for trying to figure out how to like actually operate in this reality. Um, and, but I would just say, I think that given kind of where we're at right now, the connectivity, the technology, those sort of things, how, how much information is in my face all the time has really kind of created a world where, like the uncertainty is in your face all the time. And so I think this stuff is applicable to, applicable to people just in general. Of course, the startup founder experience um, is, is a very unique one, but I can say that I just, I had joined a startup recently um, that, uh, <clears throat> you know, early I was one of, I don't know, employee number three or something like that. And I can tell you like the last year or so has felt uh, almost un as uncertain as I felt as a startup founder. Now there were some nuances there, right? Such as, you know, uh, we had money in the bank. We were able to raise some, you know, decent amount of money a couple of years ago and et cetera, before what happened the last year. Um, so, you know, you're not like eating ramen noodles and those sort of things, but I think the general energy of uncertainty going into LinkedIn every day, which I spent, basically live in is like, oh my God, I just want to torture myself with anxiety, right? Because of mm -hmm. all the stuff with the layoffs and everything. I mean, and everybody I talk to, everybody, there's a reason why we sort of like have spoken about this for the last 25 minutes, because it's something I think that collectively as a species we're feeling. Um, so I think like, you know, uh, not, you know, not to say like joining a a uh, an early stage startup is 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 as uh, um, secure or less or 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 less scary or uncertain as maybe one that's more mature. Definitely not. You know, the, it's math. The math will tell you that's not necessarily the case. But I think there's this philosophical sort of energetic um, feeling of uncertainty. Um, yeah, I that, think. You know? So I, I've I've got a few thoughts on this. Um, 
first of all, as, as just an individual, the way I take care of my, my mental health in a world in which you're constantly bombarded with negative news cycles and all this sort of stuff is I, I minimize how much external inputs I take in. And so I'm not on social media. Uh, I am, I, I don't have TikTok. I don't have Instagram. I technically have Facebook, but I don't use it. Um, I don't use anything else. I don't read news. I don't listen to news. I just intentionally exclude myself from all of that. And it is life-changing. Now you might say, Hey, what, how do you find out about important things happening in the world? Here's what I found over years of, of doing this. If it's important enough, you will hear about it from people live. What it does is you use the rest of the world as the filter of whether or not something reaches you. Because then if it's something really big happens, truly important, I'm not talking about, you know, the Chinese spy balloon floating over the U.S. Like that has no material impact on an average person's day to day, besides just it being a topic of conversation that they want to talk about with other people. But if there's genuinely something that is important to know about, e.g. COVID, then people will tell you about it. Like I remember in early 2020, when I first started here about COVID, because I wasn't following the news. So it, was, it wasn't it was a thing until suddenly it was. And I found out about it. So the big stuff you find out about, that's the first thing, minimizing or limiting the inputs that you have coming in. Now, depending on your job, you might have to be in certain things. You might have to be in Instagram, you might need to be in LinkedIn, whatever. Even LinkedIn, I'll go in, I've started posting daily and I'll go in in the morning. It'll be the first thing I do. I eat the frog and I just go in and I write my posts and then I close LinkedIn. And then I go back to whatever it is I need to do. Now, if I'm prospecting, if I'm reaching out to people, if I'm helping people, responding, I do need to go back in, but I close it whenever I'm actually done. Because otherwise what you end up doing is doom scrolling. You end up looking at the feed and even LinkedIn is probably like the better of the social medias, but you can still end up just mindlessly scrolling and then finding yourself just looking at a bunch of negative stuff that you don't need to be consumed with, but it's natural. And I find if instead I just go in with a very direct purpose, do the thing and get out as quickly as possible. It's immensely helpful for my, for my mental health. So that's the first thing that I do when it comes to, I mean, talking about like all this information being in your face and, and how do you navigate it? Very cool. Um, I'm curious uh, what you're seeing in terms of the extra time that you have then you mentioned some of the habits that you have, right? The exercise that you're doing, um, you know, are you a reader or you, do you do other things to sort of use that extra time that you've had, or do you meditate? I'm curious how you use the extra yeah. time that you're, you've gained. Yeah. Yeah. So what do I do? What's my average day look like? Or, or yeah. um, <laughs> how do I, how do I use the extra time? You know, it's fascinating because we all have so much time, but it feels like we don't have very much time. So here's another thing I did. I took the TV off my wall. I found that during COVID, I, my natural tendency would be I'd finish work for the day and I would sit on my couch and I'd turn on the TV. And next thing I know, two hours later, I was like, oh, I should probably go to bed and I'd go to bed. I took my TV off my wall. I don't have a TV in my house anymore. And now instead, I need to be very intentional about it. It doesn't mean that I don't watch things like Netflix or Hulu, but if I want to do that, I have to sit in my chair at my desk on my computer and load it up. And what I find naturally happens is when I do that, I'm like, this isn't very comfortable and I'll go do something else. It's much more comfortable to sit on my couch and read a book than it is to sit in my office chair at my desk and watch Netflix or Hulu. And so then you say like, okay, what do you do with all that time? Well, first of all, I work. Uh, I work a lot. I no matter what it is I'm doing, I put in a lot of time. So average day, I might wake up at seven in the morning. I used I, I used to have like a morning routine where I'd stretch and do a little meditation. And I journaled for a little bit. And I found that for me, actually, the best thing I can do is get started with my day as quickly as possible because I wake up and I'm ready to go. My mind is going. And the longer I delay that, the more anxiety actually builds for me. For other people, the having a morning routine like an ice bath or exercise or whatever is a good way to ease into the day and get them started. I totally get that. And it makes sense for some people. For me, I'm a big fan of, for, for me personally, starting, I start my day right away. Um, and so get into work, uh, start working. I'm now doing the first thing I'll do is post because it's the thing I want to do the least every day is post on, on LinkedIn. So it's the first thing I do. Uh, and then, you know, I work my average, I've always worked a lot. So I'll average, you know, 12, hours, probably average, some days 13 or 14, some days are 10, um, but I'll work and then try to squeeze in a workout, usually about an hour or a day on average. And 
uh, a little bit longer on the weekends. And then on the spare time, there's honestly not that much spare time at the end of the day. I, you know, I'll, I'll eat dinner, I'll, I'll meal prep in the beginning of the week. So I'll have eight meals for, for the week ready to go. And I, I don't need to cook dinner throughout the week. Um, and then a little bit of reading, a little bit of podcast listening, uh, and then usually, you know, checking in late at night on various work stuff. And then my, my nighttime routine has changed drastically. And this has been also life changing, um, uh, which I've been testing over the last few months, which is <clears throat> I don't eat anything two hours before bed. I stop having any like water, at least an hour before bed. And then I turn off all my lights and I just have a little like small light about an hour before bed. And that has been drastic, has made drastic improvements in my ability to fall asleep, take a little bit of melatonin and I'm sleeping better than I've slept in years because I'm easing into that nighttime routine. So, um, I still end up checking my phone. I'm not, you know, great about that. I'll be on my phone right until I'm ready to truly fall asleep. Um, but yeah, that's my spare time is usually spent working, maybe a little bit of podcasting, a little bit of reading. And then my one guilty pleasure is YouTube. <laughs> I watch a lot of YouTube videos about random stuff. Interesting. Um, and you mentioned working a lot. So I want to sort of shift over to the, the work and to branch um, your title. Obviously, you're the co-founder of the company, but you're also the chief operating officer, the COO. And I find that that COO role is often very misunderstood. Um, so I'd love to unpack that a little bit. And what is a COO in your words? What does your world look like? What is your daily routine at work? Um, and, and where are you focusing your attention most of the time? So what does a COO role entail and what does it look like? Honestly, it's it varies by company. It's it's funny because in the early days, I looked up and kind of read articles and asked other people. And it really varies by the industry you're in, the type of company you're in. Um, for certain operationally heavy and logistical heavy companies, COO role typically will be something actually organizing the real world in-person logistics of you know maybe delivery or... Uh, inventory, et cetera. For a software company like ours, um, it's a little bit different where for me, the way I, the way I kind of naturally formulated was I built and oversaw basically everything GNA, general administrative. So all things internal operations. So this was things like legal security, HR, recruiting, finance, accounting, basically anything that needed to be done. And then I also oversaw go to market stuff. So sales, customer success, et cetera. And so it's just kind of like a catch all role. And so people ask me like, what does the CEO do? It's, it really varies by the company, but for us, our CEO, uh, Alex and my co-founder was, he was the tech guy. He was the product guy. He led engineering, he led product. He got all that off the ground. And then it was kind of like, as you start to grow the company, as you hire your first employees, you start to recruit, as you start to scale, as you start to onboard, there's all these other things that naturally start to happen. I was the original salesperson. So I was the original person selling. And then what happened was, okay, we, we hired our first employee. Uh, we need to figure out an HR system and we need to figure out payroll. How do we pay somebody? And then it was, okay, we're going to expand internationally. How do we do that? Which countries... How do we get into these countries? Do we do we have a local entity? Do we use a PEO? Do we do something else? And then I was like, okay, we need our first privacy policy. I wrote our first privacy policy. We need our first MSA. We need our first security documents. We need to do whatever, um, SOC 2 compliance, all sorts of stuff. And I would just grab that stuff because for me, what mattered was whatever makes the business move forward fast faster, I will grab and I will do. And so that's kind of the way you know, the role evolved for me. But for different people, it's very different. It just ended up being that way at branch um, because I was just grabbing all sorts of various tasks that needed to be done. You know, you recently published the post saying that uh, you shouldn't join a seed stage startup for a variety of reasons. And yeah, I was talking to Justin as we were prepping for the conversation. We were like, did he really mean that or was he being provocative, you know, and, uh, you know, what, what's your, like, maybe we can unpack that a little bit. What's your take yeah. on it? I know there were a couple of reasons why, um, but just for the folks out there, maybe we can uh, dig in. Yeah. The, the post began joining a seed stage startup is a terrible idea. And rationally for the vast majority of people, it is a bad idea. I wrote that 
the inf the inspiration was because I was chatting with somebody who was thinking about joining an early stage company. And it it's easy to see kind of all the excitement and all the joy that comes out of joining an early stage company. And then that company becomes big and they're like, oh my God, I know my buddy. And he was part of this company that blew up and now he's the CRO. It's easy to see that. But what you don't see because of survivor bias are all the people that failed. It's kind of like the whole crypto thing. There's a lot of people that became millionaires, but you didn't see all the people that lost their life savings. And there were a lot of them. And so I was inspired to write that because I think it's important that, uh, that people understand all the challenges and all the downsides of joining a early stage, especially a seed stage startup. Because I think people go in often thinking, oh, it's going to be rosy. I worked at a hundred person company and I could do, I could join a five person company and I could do all right. It's a totally different game. The the everything about a seed stage startup is chaos. There's nothing exists. You don't have product market fit. You're doing everything, literally everything, um, from making the coffee to cold outbounding to organizing events to you know going to FedEx at you know one a.m. It doesn't matter what needs to be done. You need to do it, and the success of the business is entirely on you. And people go in, people are used to working for businesses where they come in and, you know, they want to get promoted and they work hard and they do, they get, you know, they get a raise, they get promoted. Um, but the business's success is not really dependent on that one person. They are not going to have a material impact, especially when you start getting into the hundreds or thousands of employee companies, you're not going to have a material impact as an individual. You collectively as a group can make an impact uh, at, at a large scale that actually changes the, the company trajectory. But it's it's rare for a single person to have that, even as a leader, even as a founder at that stage. Um, and so people go in and a lot of people get, they don't realize how hard and how bad it is. That said, if after knowing all of the risks and all of the downsides, you were still excited about joining a seed stage startup, then you might be the right fit. And I followed up on that post with a second post about here's all the benefits to joining an early stage startup, seed stage startup, uh, including you get to learn and grow more than anywhere you will um, compared to working at a bigger, bigger company because you're forced to constantly be operating outside your comfort zone. You're forced to constantly be learning new things. I never thought I was going to be leading sales. And I ended up building a go-to-market org. I was 200 people. Um, I never thought I was going to be doing HR. I figured I had to do all HR for years, did all payroll, did all legal, did all this stuff. I never expected that that was going to be the case. But when you are constantly operating at an early stage startup and operating outside your comfort zone, you have to learn. And so that's the biggest thing. Second thing is the team that you get to build, the camaraderie the bonding that you you make with people in an early stage startup is unprecedented. There's nothing quite like it because ultimately your survival is dependent on the group survival. And that only goes so long, right? Like your success is dependent on the group success. And so it forms this bond with the early stage, the first 10, maybe the first 20 people uh, that you don't have when the company's bigger. There's a great book that I just read called Tribe. Um, and it talks about why people bond over certain situations. And it's usually when the group survival is tied to the person's survival or their survival is tied to the group survival. That's when people start to bond and they go all in. And it's a very collaborative and group mindset rather than an individualistic mindset. So that's the second thing. And, and the third is it can really accelerate your career. If you kill it and you make the company successful, then it can accelerate your career way faster than, than just about anything else. You can definitely work up the career ladder, but that's, that'll take forever. That'll take a really long time. And if you're ambitious and you're, you know, 28, you're 30 and you want to kind of leapfrog ahead and become a, you know, a leader in five years, a great way to do that is to find the right startup and make, make it successful because it's, it's on you at the end of the day. You touched on a really interesting, I think, societal phenomenon, which is uh, we tend to focus on the the big success, right? Uh, the overnight success that in crypto, you said, you know, people making millions of dollars, right? And and not, you know, all the the tough stories and the sad stories. Um, you look at Branch, right? And uh, from the outside, we can see you guys have a hundred thousand uh, companies that are using your your products, right? You've raised uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from top tier VCs with multi billion dollar a multi billion dollar valuation. But I'm sure it's it hasn't been all uh, rosy, right? There must be some stories of 
of, of tough times and sacrifice. I'd love for you to maybe touch on that. Um, you know, is there a specific story or time that comes to mind that really, you know, was a tough time that people looking from the outside don't uh, necessarily see? Yeah. And first of all, people are captivated with overnight successes and there's no, no such thing as an overnight success. Branch is my seventh company in a period of 15 years. So this goes back to all, all the way back to 2007 when I, you know, tried my first company and the first six failed, but they led to number seven, which was branch. And so that's the first thing to keep in mind that there is no overnight success that your first idea probably isn't going to, to be the thing. Um, and that you're going to fail along the way, but that's okay. I've always, I view failures and I view those early companies as learning and training. I view everything I view in life. I view every opportunity as training for the next thing, right? No matter what it is, even with branch branch is training for the next thing. And if you view all of your endeavors like that, you'll stop looking at things like success and failures. And you'll simply look at them like lessons, like chapters, like learnings. And so everything that I do, I try to go in with that mindset. Um, going to your question of where they're challenging things in the early days of branch, dude, it's literally tears <laughs> many times early stage is hard. And so, and so few people truly kind of feel that and know that. And so stories that stick out, there's constant, there's, um, you know, insane number of stories. Let me, let me give you a few. Um, so in the very early days, you know, first within the first six months, we had built our SDKs and our APIs and we grinded really hard to get our first 10 to 20 people using using the product and implement our SDKs in their mobile apps and then launch. And there was this one app, it was a great app back in 2014 called YouNow, which was basically live streaming. And YouNow was big. They had a lot of traffic and we were not ready for their traffic. And so when they would flip on branch, they would take our servers down. <laughs> and we, you know, would be like, oh crap, we'd fix it, we'd get it up and running. And then they, you know, write into support. And it was me and Alex, my co-founder doing support. So we'd get the the emails, we'd get on a call. We'd say, oh yeah, sorry about that. Like we fixed it. We was just one thing, blah, blah, blah. And then fast forward and they do the same thing and we'd go down. And I remember because they, they were, they were our biggest and also one of our earliest users and customers. And I distinctly remember a day where it was late 2014, where they said, this is the last chance. We're going to turn it on and you better stay up. And we're like, yeah, like we got it. We fixed everything. We figured it out. We're good. They turn it on. They implement, they turn on branch and they take us down. And man, after weeks of just like convincing them and promising them and making all these changes, I slumped down like back against the wall slumped down to my to to the ground and it was just head in my hands and i'm like what are we doing we can't even keep up with this this app like why did we think we could do this and in those moments you think you're a failure and those are the moments that you want to give up the most because nothing's working we just lost our biggest customer our biggest user and we just didn't want to continue going forward but what i'll tell you is in those moments it is most important to get yourself off the ground and to keep going. And we did, and we pushed forward. And had we given up in that moment, which is what happens with a lot of people in a lot of companies, they give up when it gets hardest. That's why there's so few companies that make it out on the other end. But if you just keep going, especially in those really hard times, I promise you with consistency and hard work, you will come out the other end victorious. Now, how you define victory or success you know, can, can change by person, but that's the most important, but that was, that was one example that still vividly in my mind, uh, sticks out because I just wanted to cry and give up, uh, so bad. I, I totally get it. You know, it, it, I hear that story from you, Mike, and I, and I think, oh boy, they, they were ahead. You know, they had a, a customer who was using them. They were solving a problem. Sure. The infrastructure went down, but I, in my mind, the thing that came, you know, to to my thoughts right away was, oh, well, they were already, in a way, winning, right? From an early stage perspective, just because my experience is, you know, boy, you you don't even get there where anyone would even like think that the thing that you're building is even remotely useful 
or that they trust you enough to even use it, right? Um, or that you're even solving a problem that's that's important enough. So that that's kind of where my mind went uh, when when you told that story. You know, I was going to ask about key principles that that you have found um, that have most contributed to Brant's branch of success so far. And it sounds like tenacity and perseverance, resilience, these sort of uh, maybe non, I was about to just say non-business tactics, but in a way, in a way that, uh, you know, a business tactic without those attributes or those components um, may, maybe don't succeed. What would you say are some yeah. of those principles? Yeah, I'll, I'll break down key principles to our success in two buckets. One is the business success, what led to Branch's success. And the second is personal principles that I, I found personally have led to my own success. So on the business side, uh, yeah, the the three that that I really, that really jump out to me are speed, bias for action, and grit. And grit is kind of a resiliency and consistency thing that you were touching on. Uh, speed is urgency. I think people will spend days, months, years sometimes procrastinating, waking, waiting, planning, thinking, and there's no better way to be successful than to just operate with insane speed. Now, there's certain things that you have to do that kind of take waste time or you need, or you need to take time to make sure you get it right. But in the vast majority of things, speed is what will make the difference. And there's a great... Um, uh, Amazon's one of Amazon's leadership principles is kind of bias for action and, and speed. And one of the things they say is you don't need to wait for hundred percent or even 90% of the information to make a decision, get to 70% because there's diminishing returns. Once you start trying to get more information than that, especially with reversible decisions, two way doors where you can make a decision. If you're wrong, great. You can reverse it. But in the vast majority of cases, you're probably going to write because you don't need a hundred or even 90% of the information. And as soon as you operate with that mindset of, oh, we're just going to act, take it, take action. Um, you can, you will suddenly see immense results. Um, second is bias for action is related to speed, but bias for action is to just not procrastinate and to not plan too much. And so for us at branch, we always kind of had this concept of we're going to have a bias for action. We're just going to take initiative. We're going to act. Um, and as long as you're thoughtful about it and you use good judgment, you're probably going to be ahead of the competition and ahead of the game. And then the third is grit. Yeah. The, the resilience, being able to face tough times, stick with it, keep going, view the opportunity or view the challenges as opportunities to learn and grow. You'll you, long-term over a long enough time horizon, you will be successful on the personal principles. They're, they're aligned, they're similar, but the personal principles that really stick out for me personally, uh, one is hard work. I'm a big believer in, yes, working smart, but I believe that your outputs are directly proportional to your inputs. Now, obviously, how big of a lever you have, how much leverage you, you use, that will determine your outputs as well. But I think there's too many people that they, they think working smart is sufficient. And they forget about the the important part, which is working hard. And I'm not saying you need to work 16 hours a day, 14 hours a day, but I do believe that you need to put in the work if you want to see results. And everybody has a different lifestyle. And this isn't a one size fits all. Depending on somebody's lifestyle, they may say, I only want to work four hours a day or whatever. And that's cool. But for me, my personal success has come from working hard. And I got that from being the son of Cuban immigrant parents uh, who came to this country with essentially nothing and worked their butts off just to give me and my brothers a decent life here in the US. The second thing is consistency. I think it's easy to do some things for a short period of time, but can you be consistent? Can you do 30 outbounds a day? Can you do a podcast a week? Can you uh, always visit your customers? It's it, the consistency it is will compound over time. And I think too many people give up in the short term because they did something, it didn't provide immediate results, and then they give up. And instead, you need to focus on the inputs. If you focus on the inputs and take that long view, then you will see that compound over time, which leads to my third one, which is one of my favorites and it's something that I've never really heard other people talk about, but it's this concept of micro urgency, macro patience. And let me break this down for you. What I mean by this is, because I used to say at, at Branch, I used to talk about 
urgency, 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 urgency. And somebody called me out one day and it was during one of our kickoffs. And they said, Hey, Mike, how do you, you talk about urgency all the time and speed and bias for action. But then you also tell us as salespeople that we need to be patient, that we need to let these deals develop. And it might take six, nine, 12 months to, to work on some of these big deals. And as I reflected on, I realized in that moment, yeah, what I'm talking about is on the day-to-day, -day, you need to operate with insane urgency. Lead comes in, you better get back to them in five minutes, ideally one minute, right? You capture them right then. There is no like, wait two hours, I'll get back to them later. Email comes in, if you see it, get back to them right away. And so um, this concept of, so it's, it's this idea that in the day-to-day, -day, in the micro level, you're constantly operating with a level of urgency. However, from a macro view, you need to have patience. You need, you know that, yeah, you might have to respond to customers right now, respond to those demos, those leads, but good things take time to mature. And if you have that combination of micro urgency in your day to day, but also take the long term view and let things develop and mature over time, you will be successful. Wow, mic drop. <laughs> that was awesome, <laughs> Mike. Thank you so much for for taking the time to to talk to us about you know, a variety of different topics. Um, you know, I, I had one question that yeah. came up and, and this is just, uh, I should say one last question before we wrap up. This is just from having multiple conversations over the years with founders. And, uh, I was, uh, I think I had mentioned to you earlier that, uh, I had been, uh, chatting with a founder, who fit that tech bro kind of, you know, stereotype, which I was totally wrong. Right. Even though I'd known the person for years, that was sort of a, uh, a, 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 I think a, a misjudgment there that I made, but point is I was talking to, to this individual and they started to kind of just explain their entrepreneurial journey and how like their, their experience with mental health and, and wanting more out of life and really just kind of like, you know, um, I don't know. I think just the status quo not making sense, right? And so that drove them to go, okay, well, if this doesn't make sense. What well, you know, going to college and getting a job at a cubicle and blah blah blah. Then like, what what can I do to actually bring fire and meaning and to experience to my life? And and I think startups was definitely for this individual um, that thing. And and I gotta just say that like that has been a consistent theme, just after even talking to you today and you sharing some of your personal experiences with health, do you think there's a correlation between being a startup founder and founders that founder DNA and then uh, having experience? And I just call it having experiences with mental health um, mm. as a driver, maybe as, as some attribute in that individual that just drives them to go, it's all or nothing kind of thing. I'm not sure if there is a correlation. There may be. Um, I haven't, you know, I could speak anecdotally, but I don't want to, you know, put a label on anything. Here's here's what I will say. Um, there's certain characteristic traits that ultimately lead people to want to start a company or consistently start a company and maybe do it over and over again. Because there's a lot of people that start a company, they realize this isn't for me, and then they go and get a job working for somebody else. And I think there's a lot of uh, value in that. And I think that that makes sense for the vast majority of people. Um, I think starting a company, being an entrepreneur makes sense for a, a subset of people that are either like really irritated with the status quo or have a certain, you know, certain level of drive that, uh, to, to want to try to fix something that they're passionate about. Um, so I think there are certain traits that can lend people to be more likely to either want to get into entrepreneurship or more, more likely to be successful or stick with it long enough. Um, I don't know where kind of mental health and really fits in with that. Um, the other thing that I will say is I think there's a lot of stories out there about founders and entrepreneurs that knew from an early age, from the age of six, that they wanted to be an entrepreneur, that grew up in an entrepreneur family, that, you know, they started their first company when they were eight and it was this like advanced lemonade stand or whatever. And I think it can be scary for people that didn't have that experience, that didn't grow up, you know, thinking, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to be a business person, whatever, 
uh, to think, why would I get into it now? I've got such a late start. Kind of like with sports, it's like if you didn't start playing sports when you were young and you decide to start playing sports when you're 25, you're unlikely to be a professional. I think it's different when it comes to startups and when it comes to being an entrepreneur. Because I didn't, the first time I thought about starting something was when I was 22. I'd never in my life as a kid thought about being an entrepreneur or starting my own business. I grew up in a family, again, a son of Cuban immigrants, where you know the the thesis was or the thought was go get a secure job at a big company where you can get retire where you can work for 40 years retire get a good pension etc and it wasn't until i met this guy tyler who said Do you ever think of starting a company and i was like no never like i don't think i'm built for that but what i learned over the following five years was actually it is interesting. And after doing it enough, I was like, this is appealing to me. I think I want to go all in on that. And I say that because I think there are a lot of people out there that didn't grow up in families where entrepreneurship was a thing and that are scared because they they look at these other entrepreneurs who are out there talking about starting businesses when they were eight years old. And they think I'm not built for that. I didn't grow up with that. And you don't have to. I think you can do it as an adult. You can decide late in life. Um, look at Sam Walton. You know, starting Walmart when he was what in his fifties, yeah. um, and so you can you can start a business late in life in your thirties and your forties and your fifties, shit in your sixties, um, and that's okay. Awesome. All we have is the present moment, right? Um, what, Mike? Thank you so much for taking the time to to just chat and open up. Uh, again, I I can't thank you enough just because I love these like real conversations. By the way, I am the son of a Cuban immigrant myself. Mm. Um, came funny. over in '59. So maybe we can yes, do a sixty uh, for my parents. Yep. Yeah, same around same time, right? Uh, they actually went up to Jersey at that time because Miami was not Miami back then. Um, if folks want to follow you on social media, connect with you you know, around the topics that we discussed today, or, but maybe even around entrepreneurship in general or branch, what are the best like social media handles or methods to reach you? Best place is LinkedIn. You can follow me on LinkedIn, Mike Moline. Um, I'm posting daily now, uh, sometimes twice a day with all my lessons and learnings from scaling branch and kind of the startup world in general. So follow me there. That's the best place. Uh, and I hope to see you out there. Awesome. Well, have a great day. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks guys. Thanks, Mike.